Thanks, Barbara. It's great to be here. Uh, you're all my friends, so I, I don't really think I should be lecturing, but uh, we have the microphone and I'm supposed to stand here. And so I'll try to tell you a little bit what I know about our climate change, both globally and near to Iowa, along the lines of the report, which uh, we just mentioned and uh, we'll talk about tonight. My wife said uh, this is in the UI Explorers uh, series, which I'm very grateful to be a participant in, but my wife said, uh, you don't look like an explorer. She said, you're no explorer, so, okay. Is it more convincing now? Okay, okay. I don't think I can do that, though. Okay, climate change near and far. Uh, this is the planet in which we're uh, trying to protect. And I guess, the, as you know, uh, when we talk about climate change, we're not talking about weather. We're not talking about the day-to-day -day change in weather uh, or hourly change in a storm. Rather, we're talking about uh, decades, centuries, millennia. And you might think that even a decade, 10 years, is the smallest data point that we might think about in terms of the long-term interest in climate change. So having said that, it's hard to talk about uh, the climate in Iowa from any type of a human experience or instrumental measurement because our recordings aren't very long. We have geologists who help, to do, help us with a stratigraphic record and try to interpret what has happened in the past. And we're not gonna talk too much about that tonight, but that's a very important part of the entire story. The, uh, I'm going to show you no models tonight whatsoever, only data, because I think the data is compelling enough. Com data from multiple lines, from uh, space, from uh, surface uh, temperature measurements, from ocean platforms and uh, buoys, from mobile uh, ship uh, measurements, from down boreholes uh, in uh, uh, deep wells, from the paleo uh, uh, ecology and paleographic uh, literature, uh, we know an awful lot as well. All these lines of evidence make somewhat of a consistent story. I'd say it's not perfect. We certainly don't understand everything there is to know about uh, climate or climate dynamics. Uh, but taken in some total, I think it's rather uh, convincing. This is one of the pieces of data here. It's the uh, two different groups in uh, East Anglia and uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies in um, New York City uh, put together uh, temperature, surface temperature records independently and they're shown in the bottom slide here. And the top one is the uh, graphical geospatial depiction of that data. And the darker the red color, the hotter the temperature it is over this uh, 100 and 50 year record that we're looking at of surface temperature measurements. And first thing you might see is that in 150 years, it's, it's significantly warmer. It's about on average 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit uh, warmer. And the other thing you notice right away is that it's much warmer in certain places like the Arctic. Uh, the, the, the models, though we're not talking about the models tonight, they do get that part right because uh, it's a positive feedback loop. As the ice first begins to melt, the skin of the earth is a little bit warmer from the greenhouse gases. As the ice begins to melt, it yields a white reflective surface to a dark sea that melts more ice, more absorption of uh, radiation, and so on in a positive feedback loop. And so uh, the models do get that part right, and it is much warmer uh, in the Arctic, as you can see. Uh, the other thing I might mention uh, with this particular record is this part right here. 
most climatologists feel that the, the, what's happened in the last 30 years is really the emergence of the signal for greenhouse gases that may live long in the atmospheres, 100 years and longer. It's really now that they're beginning to kick in, in this 30 years. And at this uh, most rapid rate of ascent in temperature, is an indication that we're now beginning to really experience the effect of the warming from these greenhouse gases that are uh, accumulating in the atmosphere. One of the most remarkable things uh, uh, I tell my students is that uh, one, uh, I have them calculate uh, the mass of the atmosphere and the mass of the top couple meters of uh, living soil and the mass of the oceans because it's a very telling calculation. You rapidly see the oceans are immense, immense and huge, and the atmosphere is relatively small, by the way. You'd expect to see the effects of uh, all the billions of people that we have uh, today, 6.8 billion people, and the increased uh, economic activity you'd expect to see in the atmosphere first, and indeed we do. But I would have never guessed that we'd be able to change in our lifetime, change the whole ocean. But we are, and it's very sobering if you think that, of course, the, uh, again, it's consistent with the atmosphere. The ocean, if you smear this record over the whole thing, it's about one degree Fahrenheit warmer. So it's lagging the atmosphere, so it's a top-down warming. The atmosphere is warming first. It's about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, remember. Now the ocean sea surface temperature is about one degree Fahrenheit warmer. What's more, we can see the record easily in the Atlantic 700 meters down. And again, it's a top-down warming. It couldn't have happened due to changes in ocean circulation. Rather, it must be that the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere, has warmed first, which is again consistent with the greenhouse gas hypothesis, and down from there. It would take a thousands of nuclear power plants running hundreds of years, dumping all of their heat in the ocean to warm at one degree Fahrenheit like this. This is an immense, immense amount of heat storage already. One problem, of course, is that uh, the emissions continue to rise. And as long as the emissions continue to rise, uh, I think this is lost on many economists and others. The problem just keeps going on. It just keeps getting warmer and warmer and warmer for centuries. There's no reversal until you uh, reverse these fossil fuel emissions. And the uh, curve shown here is the original 1990, I believe, prediction by the uh, United Nations uh, program, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, of different scenarios, they tried to bracket anything that could possibly be possible, but they missed even on the scenarios uh, constructed. Our emissions have grown much faster or faster even than uh, any of the scenarios imagined uh, back 20 years ago by the IPCC. Because the skin of the Earth is beginning to warm, and 1.4 degrees may not sound like too much to you, you have to ask, well, what are the impacts so far? This is the climate change far we're talking about now. And one of the climate changes far is the Arctic and the melting of the ice. And this is sea ice that's floating, so that doesn't affect the sea uh, surface uh, level, the elevation of the sea but rather it does affect the uh, animals who live and make, a, and make a, a living off of the Arctic like the polar bears. So this loss of ice affects the temperature, as we mentioned. It affects the species and the animals, as we mentioned, but not the sea level. The ice has opened up enough that people are very keen to explore now for oil and minerals and things like that, and there's at least three countries already fighting over those uh, rights. Ironically, uh, burning of fossil fuels has opened up more area for exploration of fossil fuels. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, is obvious about this is that the Arctic sea ice is melting. We've had pretty good satellite observations of many of the things I'm showing you since 1979. That is in jeopardy, actually, our Earth observing uh, satellites. We've had two failed launches and the funding for it is in 
jeopardy, which is maybe another story. But the Arctic sea ice is melting much faster than any of the models or anyone would have predicted. And we don't know why. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't, we don't understand everything, but the data taken as a whole makes a fairly consistent uh, picture. One hypothesis here is that the particles from cook stoves and from um, uh, burning uh, emissions, uh, even biomass burning, natural fires and so forth, have caused uh, black carbon to uh, go into the Arctic, for example, settle on the snow, and that's not in the models. It's not in any of the models. So that, that has caused the ice to melt much faster. Just one hypothesis. Greg Carmichael in our center is very much uh, involved in working on this hypothesis and had a paper in uh, Nature on it. This is a view, I didn't take this picture, I borrowed it, but this is a view from uh, Greenland, the heart of Greenland, actually in 2007. Uh, and uh, this is fairly typical of the meltwater. And they, they, they call it a moulin. It, it uh, is a deep shaft of water dropping down. And the concern is that it could lubricate the ice, uh, earth, ice, Greenland interface and cause uh, ice, ice uh, sheet to uh, fall off faster. And there's some indication that the rate has increased, but nothing dramatic so far. Certainly the melt rate itself, that which I showed you, the liquid water, it's equivalent to about half a Lake Erie each year right now. So to put it into some context, about half of Lake Erie each year is melting off of Greenland alone and adding to the sea surface temperature. So this problem is different than the Arctic ice that we showed earlier because this does affect sea surface temperature, most sea, sur sea surface elevation, most definitely. The melt area is shown in this slide, and you can see it, there's a lot of noise in the data, so don't get too concerned about any given year. 2008 and 9 were a little bit cooler, but the trend is really uh, clear that the melt rate is continuously increasing. This is, again, satellite data, and and quite accurate since 1979. Uh, have the uh, ice sheets begun to fall off of the continent faster in addition to the liquid melt rate I showed you earlier? There's some indication, but I think the verdict is, is still out on that. This, this is one of the ice streams off the coast of Greenland. Similarly, uh, we are concerned about Antarctica. Uh, Antarctica, the ice shelves in Antarctica are again balanced on the continent of Antarctica, but uh, hanging into the uh, ocean. There the concern is, so they're, they're, they won't, ex when they fall off, they won't exert much of a uh, sea level effect because uh, most of the weight uh, is being borne by the sea rather than by the continent itself. But there is uh, the concern that once those fall off, you have a, mu a much more rapid gravitation of the sheet itself into the ocean with increased uh, sea level rise. We call that, a, the, it's actually not much talked about in the United Nations reports, probably should be. It's called abrupt climate change. The notion that ice sheets could move quickly within, say, years and fall into the ocean and raise sea level maybe uh, 10, 20 meters, something like that, 30 feet or, or more. The reason it's not talked about much in the reports is because it's really a probabilistic uh, calculation. We think that the probability is small, but the consequences are, are very great. Uh, I think we should still find a way to somehow uh, deal with that. There is evidence that especially Western Antarctic is, in general, the continent is uh, gaining ice in this case, unlike Greenland. But that western edge of it is warmer. We, one hypothesis is that the uh, water is warmer there. I showed it in an earlier slide. And it undercuts the shelves, and that's what's causing them to break off. But I, th I think uh, it's not certain. This is actually a satellite view of the uh, most recent one, the Wilkins Ice Sheet. 
breaking off. This is a 26 mile long iceberg here. And again, it was balanced with its edge on the continent and its tail in the sea. It fell off and then that allows, that could allow the ice sheet behind it to uh, move by gravity faster. The, one of the more recent stories, even since the last uh, IPCC report, is that sea level is rising a lot faster. Uh, just 10 years ago, if you were to ask me, I'd say, well, the, uh, again, the satellite data is pretty good on this, and it's rising maybe about mm, an inch uh, a decade, something like that. And so that would be a foot in 100 years or so. But now the rate seems to be roughly double that. And the new uh, estimates, not counting abrupt climate change, but the new estimates just from the ice melting, as I showed you on Greenland, is about uh, 0.6 to 1.8 uh, meters. So uh, roughly uh, one and a half feet to uh, almost uh, five, five feet higher sea level in just the next 100 years. Oh, I, I should mention that prior to this time, uh, the sea level that we rise that had been measured and we were experiencing was entire, virtually entirely due to the thermal expansion of the oceans. I showed you that they're a one degree Fahrenheit warmer. Water expands as it uh, warms. So it was very consistent and very easily uh, calculated. But now the big um, change in the equation, the change in the slope of this line is the melt rate off of uh, especially Antarctica and the glacial, uh, the uh, continental glaciers melting. So all of the, most of the glaciers uh, on the land are melting worldwide and that's adding to the sea level rise. Again, nobody hardly talks about abrupt climate change, but if, the, if that were to happen, there'd be a significant raise in sea level in a rather short period of time, let's say a decade or, or two. And uh, these are the areas in blue that would be uh, inundated as a result of abrupt uh, change like that. Pretty dire consequences for Florida and Bangladesh and uh, parts of Africa and so forth. Well, that's climate change far. Let's talk about climate change near in Iowa. Uh, as Sarah said, there was a recent report. Uh, I was a member of that uh, committee, uh, as were the, all these other folks who are listed on the left lower uh, part of this slide. It was meant to be a regents uh, committee, and uh, Senator Hogue may be able to inform us better, but I would say the purpose of the report was that there's a lot of skepticism in Des Moines and in the State House about really whether we should do any, anything. And so the question just was, well, tell, tell us exactly, you know, what are the impacts on Iowa so far from climate change? That was our charge, I would say. And uh, I'll try to show you what we, some of the things that we found out. One of the clearest thing in the record, uh, and now we're talking about a record that only goes back 100 or 140 years. The m clearest thing in that record is that in the Midwest, there's been an increase in the intensity of precipitation. That's the absolutely most clear thing, highly statistically significant. Uh, there's, the rainfall events have increased compared to 100 years ago. I, I, I won't read all the, the uh, literature on the left-hand side, but we think we understand why. We have an infrared satellite, the AIRS uh, instrument on the uh, NASA satellite, and uh, it shows increasing moisture in the atmosphere, most importantly, very high in the atmosphere, where the most intense uh, storms are spawned. So uh, within the last 50 years or so, certainly within uh, most of our lifetimes, there's been a significant increase in the frequency of the 1% events, the strongest storm events in precipitation about 31% increase in the Midwest, and I was a part of that, but check out the Northeast, even much more in the Northeast. Remember uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts last year? 
remember uh, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana right at the current uh, time and all the uh, storms in Iowa as well. That's the clearest thing in the record. And this is a frequent re reminder to me of our, our building. You may know this actually didn't, the, the sandbags happened to hold here. This flooded inside out. It came through the um, steam tunnels and flooded on the other side, but uh, we were not spared. And as you know, it'll be years before University of Iowa can recover from the flood of 2008. There's pretty good evidence in the record, not that winds have increased. Actually, there's some evidence that winds have decreased, which is counter to some um, speculation and hypothesis, but that the extremes in uh, precipitation and the extremes in temperature have increased. In fact, again, markedly, as temperatures started to go up, I showed you in the last 30 years where we think the effective greenhouse gases are really kicking in, that's the same period that the uh, extremes have begun to increase. It stands to reason that there's more energy that has to be dissipated in the climate system, and that mostly so far, we've only been talking about the averages, the means, but really, um, uh, the climatologists are, are only mildly interested in that. It's really all about the extremes, what's happening uh, to the uh, variation. And that seems to be increasing both precipitation and uh, temperature. Now, if you ask about the average temperature in Iowa, you may remember from the very first slide on temperature that the Arctic was a lot hotter, but we were sort of kind of average. And indeed, we're kind of like the global average. Our increase in temperature has been, because we're in mid-latitude, uh, our average increase in temperature has been roughly the same as the planet has experienced as a whole around uh, 1.4, 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit over the past 137 years. This is data from uh, Gene Tackley, the uh, committee member and uh, climatologist from Iowa State University, who really was the only one to examine primary data for the report, and I, I think we owe him a debt of gratitude. Well, you say, well, it's one and a half degree Fahrenheit uh, over 137 years. Well, when exactly does that occur? Mostly in the wintertime and mostly at night uh, throughout the year, especially in the summer, I'll show you. So uh, these are wintertime temperatures in Iowa. They're three to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer in just the past 30 years. So you may not believe it from the last three winters we've had, and I lose a lot of credibility with these tough winters that we've been having. But uh, indeed, the winters are warmer, and, and really significantly warmer and milder. So we're living with climate change already, whether we want to admit it or not. Daily. These are, uh, this is a Krigging process that they do on daily uh, temperatures from the meteorology stations. High and low average And then smeared with the Krigging. I'll show you some point data in a minute that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, Gene Tackley worked up the number of frost free days. Um, farmers uh, already are responding. Uh, when I moved back to Iowa in 1977, the average day of uh, planting was uh, second week in May, May 15th, May 10th to the 15th was the average day of planting. It's about a month earlier now. They're, they're moving it up and uh, continuously moving it up whenever they can get into the fields because they're worried about the fields being wet also. So uh, clearly uh, we do have a longer growing season now. That's a good thing, right, I think. That's a good thing, uh, at least for the purposes of uh, growing uh, certain crops. And yields are up, to be sure. We think yields are up mostly due to the, quali the seeds that are being planted and the genetically modified uh, crops that are pervasive in uh, Iowa. They're performing extremely well. Uh, but also because we've had an awful lot of moisture, uh, as we've seen, and uh, you can get too much, but uh, in general, it's important to have enough precipitation for the crops to do well. 
Last year, uh, it's hard to recall already, but it seems like so long ago, but 2010 was actually a really hot year, especially on the uh, east, uh, eastern coast, as you can see from this. The red dots are all-time high uh, temperatures recorded for the summer, June, July, August in 2010. And you can see awful lot, of, these are record temperatures in a 125-year uh, record. So that's pretty remarkable. And, but you'd say, well, gee, Iowa uh, doesn't look too bad uh, last year anyway. We're just looking at a single year now, and climate is all about decade to decade and longer. But our nighttime temperatures is what was peculiar about Iowa and fits the whole climate picture that we're examining tonight. Uh, we had a, a record number of stations in Iowa with record a nighttime summer temperatures. So this is consistent with the story that I mentioned earlier of the air satellite and more moisture in the air. Uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, as you know, and it helps to trap uh, the energy uh, into the earth so the nights are, are warmer. And we see clear evidence of this uh, in the record, including last year. Well, you say, well, if, if rain, global rainfall is uh, increasing, the, f the hydrologic flywheel is spinning faster, right? Yes, it is. So how much is Iowa increased in precipitation? Well, only about three inches in 137 years. But you may recall in the intensity of uh, precipitation map, we're kind of on the edge. In general, everything east of us is wetter, warmer, and everything west of us, for the most part, is drier, warmer. So we're kind of on the edge of this pattern. We're being influenced heavily by the Gulf Stream still. And Gene Tackley, our climatologist, warns us that you know, being kind of on the edge, the patterns could change. But at the moment, we're wetter, warmer. And that's probably what you should prepare for or expect uh, in the future is more wetter, warmer, because the greenhouse gases and the emissions, as I showed you, are increasing so dramatically. So being on the edge uh, of this, these two patterns, um, we see a very clear pattern in Iowa from west to east. So even though the average is only three inch uh, increase in 137 years, the pattern in the eastern part of the state is much more. I've got these a little bit out of Shoot, what'd I do? Yeah, oh, I missed it. Yeah, this is what one I wanted. Uh, so Cedar Rapids, more in the eastern part of the state, has had about an eight, eight inch increase, something like this, much more. Uh, I grew up in Davenport. I remember as I was growing up, people would say, well, we get 32 inches of rainfall a year in Davenport, right? Wrong, you know, now it's about 38 inches of rainfall a year in uh, Davenport, just in, my lifetime. So these changes are rather dramatic uh, from the standpoint of how quickly they've occurred, actually. Uh, one of the interesting things in the record is the more moisture in the air, right? That means higher dew points. Farmers know about this too. They've not only changed their planting techniques, but their harvesting techniques because generally you don't want to harvest while the crop has dew on it. And that means you have to uh, work much harder to find a non-dew uh, period in order to get your crop in. And the dew points have risen just in the last 40 years quite dramatically. The red is uh, in Des Moines. I should remind you that not everything is bad about climate change and not everything is bad about what we've experienced here. We already mentioned a longer growing season. There's more carbon dioxide in the air that's particularly good for soybeans. Uh, as a result of uh, climate change. That doesn't do much for corn, but particularly good for beans. More precipitation, good for yields. Warmer winters. What does warmer winter do? Well, it uh, causes us to have less heating days, less degree days in which we're required to heat our homes in the wintertime. This translates into energy savings in the engineering Parlance, it would be a negative feedback loop because we use less fossil energy because now we're warmer in the winter. We don't have to heat our homes anymore. 
In fact, uh, despite the last three winters or so, we still have yet to break the minus 15 degree Fahrenheit. We came off of coast a couple times this year, uh, but uh, we almost very seldom have days below 15 below Fahrenheit any longer. Pretty dramatic change in the record. The models get this right. They don't necessarily get this right. We've also seen a very clear trend in declining number of days over 100. And, I, and you may remember when you were little, a lot more really hot days, or seemingly so. It's true. We almost never have a day over 100 any longer. In fact, we don't even have many days over 90 anymore. The models don't necessarily get this right. In fact, they generally miss it. I think it has to do, again, with how much moisture there is in the air and how much more difficult it is to heat a warm, a wet volume of air compared to a dry. If it's dry, it's much easier. It takes less energy to warm that. This is really sensitive, Sarah. I, I, to be, I can't look at it. Back to the precipitation. This is a, a famous uh, picture from the wire service on AP, I think it was, uh, uh, in uh, June of uh, 2008 in Waterloo. And uh, look at the look on these uh, fellows' faces as the uh, river rose to rec uh, all-time record uh, levels in both Waterloo and later on in Cedar Rapids. Uh, in fact, the Cedar River at Waterloo, the top part is the uh, precipitation. We had kind of a wet fall to begin with, so this is two inches of precip right here. And you can see in about 10 days preceding the uh, flood of 2008 in Waterloo, we had about 14 inches of rain. And uh, the worst part for Cedar Rapids, as you may know, was that just as the peak of the uh, hydrograph was coming down the Cedar River, about three more inches right on top of it at just the worst possible time. It truly was a, uh, a, a remarkable uh, event. And it left Cedar Rapids looking like this, as you remember. Uh, total damages, what were the final total damages, 700? million, something like that? No, no, you're low. That's too low. It's, they generally say somewhere between four to six billion, and it depends on how you try to count it. That's wow. average statewide is 80 to 10 billion. I'm going to show some slides that differ with that, but, but uh, I'm sure there are some differences of opinion. <laughs> These are from the report. I'm just using the slides from the report. Uh, of course, one of the big, the, the $64,000 question, I guess, is uh, could these type of floods experienced by Waterloo and by Cedar Rapids have been prevented if we had uh, a more natural um, land cover uh, land use? And uh, there are a lot of people working on that question, but uh, I think the answer so far is that uh, yes and no. The, the peaks of the hydrographs, the, the worst part of the storm, could be shaved off if we hadn't cleared, drained all our wetlands, cleared all our prairies, and uh, cut down our uh, riparian uh, forests. And also moderate floods probably could be avoided uh, entirely. But keep in mind that what we're witnessing here is both a change in land use and a pretty dramatic change in climate over the same 100-year time period. The two together are kind of deadly. And so could we have avoided that remarkable storm that I just showed you that came in 2008 on the Cedar River? I doubt it. Could we have shaved maybe some of it uh, off? Quite likely. Could we prevent uh, milder floods from occurring if we restored some wetlands? put some deep-rooted uh, prairie grasses back in, slowed the water down, kept it in the, uh, up in the watershed? I think so. Maybe it's not a clear-cut answer, but I think that's the truth. One of the concerns and mentioned in the report quite prominently is soil loss. When you have these kind of events, uh, especially not only, I haven't mentioned it, but 
not only has our amount of precipitation and the intensity changed in Iowa, but the pattern has changed some too. It's moved more into the spring and uh, summer uh, months, less into the uh, fall and winter. And so we're getting um, uh, a lot of rainfall at a time before crops and other vegetation has canopied. This is the soil erosion from 2008 alone. It's calculated, it's not measured. Uh, Bob Libra may know this is from our Iowa soil erosion model, uh, which is, is a very interesting website. It's actually supported by Purdue University now, but originally developed at Iowa State. And uh, the calculations from this model indicate that we sustained in the red and orange colors 40 and 50 tons of soil loss uh, per in that one year. And generally we say that no more than five tons per acre of soil loss is acceptable or sustainable. So pretty significant loss of soil as a natural resource uh, just in one year. And more of that will occur uh, despite the fact we're doing more conservation tillage and more no-till, we're losing it still on account of the change in climate. Along with the soil runs off more nutrients. I have a student, just that we have a paper just about to come out on the role of the 2008 flood in Gulf hypoxia. Iowa lost about a billion dollars in uh, fertilizer as a result of just the 2008 uh, flood. And uh, you can see that we're at the epicenter of the nutrient loss nationwide for both nitrogen on the left and phosphorus on the right. And the exhaust pipe goes down to the Gulf of Mexico. So you can imagine the folks in the coastal areas are, are very uh, mad at us and would like to uh, stop this runoff of nutrients and Gulf hypoxia. These are the figures uh, from Dave Swenson at Iowa State, Rob, that are in our report. And uh, it t sums to about $3 billion in losses, about $1 billion for ag and $1 billion.3 for, and that's mostly Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, I believe, in 2008, and uh, the other uh, weather-related losses. One of the issues in the report is that uh, it, it's not talked about too much, but there's, there's health effects associated with this. We have an epidemic of childhood asthma in this country, in Iowa also. It, uh, it's not clear whether it's more detection, but probably it's a, it's a real effect. And we have a great increase due to the increase in moisture in the air, a great increase in allergens, pollen, and mold spores. Uh, which cause uh, uh, respiratory problems. Certainly, if you've got to clean up a home like this one, this is a Cedar Rapids home, you're gonna, uh, you, and, and you've got a respiratory illness, you're in trouble. And uh, we had a lot of people uh, getting sick as a result of getting back into their homes uh, in recent years, 2008 and 2010 in Iowa. That's above and beyond just the average increase in pollen and allergens and mold as a result of the increase in uh, humidity and, and uh, water vapor. Uh, Laura Jackson at the University of Northern Iowa reminded us that uh, it affects species too. And uh, this happens to be uh, our poster child for uh, species effect of climate change in Iowa. It's the wooded nesting uh, turtle, wood turtle, and uh, it lays it it's in central Iowa. It lays its eggs out in the middle of a sandbar in, in the middle of summer. And of course, we're getting big uh, events in June and July now, and that uh, causes their eggs to, uh, they do that to avoid predators, but ironically, the worst predator, humans, uh, is the one changing the climate and washing the eggs away. So first, the recommendations from the Climate Change Committee, there were seven or eight. I think they're common sense, but uh, they bear repeating. The first one is that uh, obviously we have to begin to, uh, the report is mostly about adaptation, about uh, that we're living with climate change. It's already here, folks. You better try to adapt to it. One aspect of adapting is planning for, plan that things will flood make your buildings floodable like the Beckwith 
uh, rowing uh, center here, harden the infrastructure, all of, all of the low-lying uh, capacitors and uh, transformers for the wells, which you want to keep going in your water plants so you don't lose the water plant. Everything has to be raised up. Everything is in the lowest lying point right now. I'm pleased to say that both Iowa City and Cedar Rapids are, have plans to do much of that. In Iowa City, we have $133 million uh, flood plan since 2008, and we're 80-some million dollars of the way in uh, completing it. Much of it has to do with hardening infrastructure, raising roads, raising bridges. The um, bridge, the Park Avenue bridge, will likely be located some, somewhere to the north, very close to where it uh, once was in uh, early uh, settlement times. Protect Iowa soil, water quality, and ag productivity. This is because we're losing all our soil, as I mentioned to you, and uh, we, we know how to avoid that with uh, uh, riparian zone uh, plantations, uh, terracing, um, re allowing our streams to meander, slowing them down, and so on. Investing in wildlife habitat, because uh, you may know that bird populations are down quite a bit from all, all this uh, uh, precipitation, and uh, also because of the commodity crop prices right now, there's an awful lot of pressure to decrease um, grasslands and uh, go towards row crops. One of the interesting, more interesting recommendations I thought was uh, that the Iowa Department of Public Health should be re reporting the, the health effects issue isn't on the radar screen of anybody, I don't think. And so one recommendation was that the Iowa Department of Public Health should make an annual report on uh, allergies, asthma, emphysema, and so forth, and, and, to, and to look at the trends and to try to attribute uh, causes to the extent that they can. Uh, another one is that while we can't change federal highway uh, standards, design standards, in order to um, harden them against uh, flooding and, and severe storms, we can at least advocate for it. And that's one of the recommendations. And lastly, uh, the Iowa Insurance Division is all over this. They know everything we've talked about. They're uh, quite on top of the risks associated with uh, climate change. We just would like them to report back to us what kind of products are you developing and how and why, how can we insure ourselves against uh, uh, these kind of events in the, in the future. So to summarize, uh, the climate is already changing. We are living with climate change, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, some people are already changing their behavior as a matter of fact. We need to adapt. That's what this report was really about, uh, in part because the State House really doesn't want to talk too much about mitigation, to be perfectly honest. But we have to join the rest of the world eventually, somehow, in lowering those emissions that we looked at earlier, so-called mitigation. That's the hardest part of all. And in the absence of mitigation, you can expect the next 100 years to be much, much warmer, and, but more importantly, uh, have much more extremes. Uh, the average is thought to be about five degrees Fahrenheit uh, warmer in the next hundred years. Remember, we've only had one degree Fahrenheit so far. So this puts us into the realm of uh, glacial periods. You know, a, a six to eight degree Fahrenheit change is uh, on the order of the type of temperature change that moves us out of a, of a uh, glaciated period of an ice age. And uh, so these are really big changes to occur in uh, just 100 years. One might expect greater storm intensities, more severe droughts, and floods. Thanks very much.